Okay, so welcome all to this um, SIB Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series. Today we have the pleasure to host Laurent Escoffier, uh, who is co-director of the Institute of Ecology and Evolution at the University of Bern, and also the head of the Population Genetics uh, Division. So Laurent got his PhD in uh, Molecular Anthropology in 88 at the Department of Anthropology of the University of Geneva here in Switzerland. He then went on to a postdoctoral training at the Center for Theoretical and Applied Genetics at the uh, Rutgers University in the U.S. In 91, uh, Laurent came back to Europe and he became maître assistant uh, at the Department of Anthropology in Geneva. And in 95, he became maître d'enseignement et de recherche in the same department. And in um, 2001, uh, he got promoted full professor in population genetics uh, in the Institute of Ecology and Evolution of the University of Bern. So since 2008, Laurent is also a group leader uh, of the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, leading the Computational Population Genetics Group. So Laurent's group uh, is interested in the development of computational methods uh, to understand evolutionary processes at the population and the species level. Uh, the group is also involved in the development of statistical methods which rely on massive computer simulations to re reconstruct the past demography of a species from its genetic diversity and to test among various alternative evolutionary scenarios. The group is also devote, uh, devote, it also devotes time to uh, the maintenance and the extension of various computer programs, which you can find at uh, the list on the um, group webpage, including the popular uh, program called Arlequin, for the analysis of population genetics data. So today, Laurent will tell us about demographic inference from NGS data. Laurent, thanks again for accepting this invitation, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Diane. So it's my pleasure to be here to present you a bit some of the work we've been doing mostly in the last two years. And um, as Diane said, uh, we're interested in trying to develop methods to infer um, past demographic events from genomic data. And that's a bit what I'm going to present to you today. So, um, so, what we are trying to do is to take some samples and from these samples try to reconstruct the past of a given population or species. And um, usually the true um, history of a species um, is very complex, so it involves some population splits, some subpopulation that got extinct, and then some other population had mixed and formed new populations that um, <coughs> that progress in time and space until the present day. So that's the, usually the true history of a species, and that's what we would like to reconstruct, but of course we cannot really do that. So what we are doing is just take some samples, I said, and try to sequence the genome of these guys and uh, infer uh, polymorphic position SNPs, uh, get the genotypes, compute their frequencies, and we try to reconstruct a history that is uh, a bit simpler than the real true history of the, 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 the real population. So what we are doing is that we are building some models. So this could be super simple models like those ones, but also more complex models that I will present you a bit later. And uh, given a, a particular model, then we try to estimate the parameters of this model. Okay, so you still need to realize that the, the truth is more complex than what we are, or what we can try to reconstruct, but we hope to try to get the main features of the history uh, <coughs> for a given species. So in this talk, I'll first try to present you a bit how we can connect patterns of uh, genomic diversity to uh, <coughs> past history. And uh, then I'll present you um, a bit the method we are using to 
reconstruct this demographic history that is based on the side frequency spectrum. I will introduce you to these things. And then uh, I'll go into some applications of these methods. Uh, one on um, the settlement of Australia by modern humans, and the other one on um, trying to determine if there was some gene flow between bonobos and chimpanzees in the recent past. Okay. So first, how can we connect um, demography to genetics? So um, on this slide, which is relatively complex, we can see some uh, potential scenarios of populations. So you can have a stationary population, some population that went through recent expansion, or a population that went through some kind of recent bottleneck, right? And uh, in each of these cases, we can try to predict a bit what will be the genealogy of genes that we are sampling. And these gene genealogies or these coalescent trees are quite different under these different uh, evolutionary models. And then we can just add mutations on the branches of these genealogies. And if you look at the different uh, mutation frequencies under the three scenarios, they have quite different properties. Okay? So in a constant population or stationary population, we have a mixture of rare mutations that occur on the terminal branches and a mixture of more frequent mutations that occur on the internal branches. In the case of uh, recent expansion, we have most of the mutation that will occur on terminal branches, and so we will have mainly rare mutations. And if we have a recent bottleneck, then we'll have most mutations that have, that actually can have almost any frequency. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> so it implies that the earlier frequencies uh, that we observe at different sites on the genome are informative uh, about the demographic history of those populations. So, and we try to summarize these patterns of high frequencies by what, by what we call the side frequency spectrum. And this side frequency spectrum is just the distribution of these uh, <coughs> frequencies of the derived alleles or of the mutations. And uh, just to show you a bit how it works, so suppose that we have uh, just five sequences, um, and here we are just listing the polymorphic positions. And we also assume that we sort of know what is the ancestral state, state of the alleles and what is the derived <coughs> allele. We can just count what is the frequency of the derived allele for each site. Okay? So if we take the first site, the derived allele is just a frequency of one. It's just present in one time out of five sequences. And at the second site, this derived allele has a frequency of two, at the third side, frequency of one, etc. So we can just summarize all these patterns of diversity by this distribution of allele frequencies. And here we are just trying to see how many times do we see a derived allele that has a frequency of one, of two, of three, or of four. And we are just counting these frequencies among um, <coughs> the sites of our sequence. Okay, so that's, that's what we call the site frequency spectrum. And if we look at what is the shape of this site frequency spectrum under different scenario, we can see it's very different, right? So in blue, you have the case of a stationary constant size population, and you have this kind of exponential decay of the frequency of the size that are singletons, doubletons, tons, etc. Uh, when we have a population expansion, as we have seen, we have an excess of low frequency variants. We have many singletons. And when we have a bottleneck, we usually have a much flatter distribution. Okay, so these are a bit extreme cases, but it just shows you that the side frequency spectrum can be very different under different demographic scenarios. Okay, so we are just trying then, as we shall see, trying to fit what is, trying to find what is the most likely scenario that can explain this side frequency spectrum. So we can see here a side frequency spectrum within a single population, but when we have a bit more complex cases where we have two populations, we can see that depending on the time of divergence of these populations, on the level of migration between these populations, we can have different uh, joint site frequency spectra. So, okay, so on, on the lower side, we have uh, the site frequency spectrum that corresponds to the figure on top. And so in case of isolation, we can see, so on, maybe I explain to you this, um, this uh, side frequency spectrum. So on uh, the x-axis is the frequency of an allele in population one. On, on the y-axis is the frequency of this same allele 
in population two. So if we consider what is the diagonal, it's the sites that have the same frequencies uh, so, uh, in the two populations, right? So, and if we have, uh, and then there's a color code from very frequent uh, cases to less frequent cases. So it means here that we have a majority of the sites that are fixed in and at low frequencies in one population or in the uh, other population. And this is because the two populations have diverged for, oops, for a long time, and therefore <clears throat> they have drifted away, and we have some private alleles in the two populations. But when we have migration between the two um, populations after divergence, then uh, we have much more correlated allele frequencies, so it means that the allele frequencies are much more similar between the two populations. Okay? So and we can extend, we can play this game in two dimensions, we can play this game in three dimensions, and we can extend that to multi-dimensions if we have more than three populations. Right? So, uh, and now the game consists in trying to see, or to, to infer what is the expected shape of this side frequency spectrum under different scenarios. And for this, we are using, in our case, computer simulations. Okay? And we are using some relatively recent, not so old theory about, which is the coalescent theory, where we are trying to reconstruct the genealogy of some genes that are currently sampled. So in this case, we have, uh, let's say, at a given locus, so seven genes. And we are trying to reconstruct what are the series of coalescent events that uh, allows us to pass from seven to six, five, four, three, two, and one single lineage until we reach this most recent common sister. We are just trying to reconstruct a tree that is possible under a given scenario. Okay? And given this simple tree, we're asking ourselves, what is the priority that uh, if I have a mutation, this mutation has a frequency of one, two, three, four, five, six, Etc. Okay. And for instance, in red, you can see uh, branches on which, if there is a mutation, this mutation will have a frequency of two. Okay. So if a mutation falls on this B2 branch, this mutation will be found in these two lineages, it will have a frequency of two. Same thing if a mutation occurs on this other B2 branch, and same thing on this other B2 branch. Okay. So the overall priority that if there is a mutation, this mutation has a frequency of two, is just, for this tree, the sum of the red segments over the total length of the genealogy. Okay? If it falls on something else, it will have a different frequency, right? So, and we can compute this priority that it has a frequency of two as the sum of these B2 segments. We can compute the, the priority that it has a frequency of one if we sum the B1 segments and this B4 segment would be the priority that it has a frequency of four, and this B6 segment would be the, frequency, the priority that it has a frequency of six, right? So with a single simulation, we can reconstruct a very crude side frequency spectrum, which looks like this, okay? And this, this is just obtained by summing these branch lengths, right? So what we can do is to then simulate another uh, coalescent tree under the same scenario, and we are doing the same thing. In this case, these red branches are smaller, I mean, less long than in the former case, but these are the recent relative priority to have a mutation as frequency of two. So we can somehow add this side frequency spectrum that we obtained on the second one, and we can repeat these things many times, okay? So typically, we repeat that 100,000 times or 1 million times to get a very smooth side frequency spectrum under any given scenario, right? And that's a bit what we get here, okay? And as we shall see, this is implemented in the program that we have developed called Fast Simple Cloud 2. Okay? So that's how we're using simulations to try to get this expected side frequency spectrum under any given scenario that we can simulate. Now, the next step consists in trying to find the side frequency spectrum under a given model that is as close as possible as the observed one, right? So that's a bit this game that we are trying to play, and we are using 
some likelihood framework to try to find the expected side function that maximizes the likelihood of the model. Right? And <clears throat> again, we get this expected side function using simulation. And uh, the problem there would be to try to get the maximum likelihood uh, <coughs> side frequency spectrum, right? But um, that's what we have been trying to do. And this was uh, done in a program that we published a few years ago, uh, where we, as I said, use coalescent simulation to estimate this side frequency spectrum and approximate the, the likelihood. Uh, we use some uh, specific algorithm to try to find the maximum likelihood parameters. Uh, this program is relatively fast. Uh, now it's multi-threaded and it can explore quite a wide variety of uh, models. And uh, also we, we can explore the parameter ranges relatively well. And uh, it can also handle, in principle, a bit an arbitrary number of populations. But for most practical purposes, up to five, six, eight population, uh, it's okay. If it's above, then it becomes a bit more complicated, right? So, so we just checked that this method works well on simulated data, and we just had some kind of toy examples, which was a model like this with three populations that diverged at some time, and there was some bottleneck. So it's a history that could represent a bit human demography with some ancestral bottleneck and divergence of, let's say, Europeans and Asian population at some stage <clears throat> that split from some African population. And we're trying to reconstruct the, the age of this bottleneck, the divergence times, the migration rate, the time of, or the, the size of this bottleneck, um, etc. Okay, and so we'll not tell you in details, but the Red dots re represent the true value of the parameters, and the black uh, box plot represent the <clears throat> estimated value from 10 realization. And we see that, on average, uh, our method works well and a bit better than some previous approach for complex models. And, <clears throat> and this previous approach, that it was limited to three populations, but with this method, we can go to more than that. And in this case, it's a case with 12 population that we analyzed in uh, some specific context of a continent that uh, sends migrants to different islands. And uh, we can see that we can reconstruct or infer the, uh, this degree of isolation of migration rates from this continent to the islands relatively well, even in these complex cases where we have uh, as much as 12 populations. So it seems to work relatively well. Okay, so. We've been um, analyzing some kind of conventional um, data sets, but then we, we were contacted by um, uh, SK Veloslev and Anasafo Malaspinas, who were in Denmark, as asking us to try to uh, <coughs> estimate some relatively complex demography based on full genome in the context of the settlement of Australia. Okay, and so in, in our lab, so. Uh, Isabel Alves, Victor Souza, and Isabel Tomblou contributed to, to these um, computations. So <clears throat> just to briefly introduce you to the settlement of Australia. So what is remarkable for this settlement is that it's very old. So there are uh, <clears throat> traces of human presence uh, for about a bit more than 50,000 years uh, <clears throat> from archaeological artifacts and uh, close to 50,000 years with real fossils in, in Australia. So uh, if we look at the map of Australia, um, we see that currently it's detached from New Guinea, but maybe up to 10,000 years ago, there was still some kind of connection, some land bridges between these two uh, islands, uh, and this formed some kind of big continent called Sahu. Okay? And this was also disconnected from another subcontinent called Sunda, which included uh, many Southeast Asian islands, okay? So, um, and it's not really clear how and exactly when this Sahul continent was settled, but what is relatively clear is that to go from Southeast Asia to Sahul, you need to cross at least eight to 18 uh, uh, sea crossings uh, that were at least 30 kilometers uh, 
long. Okay, so it will suggest that the people who did that were not just drifting like uh, at random, but maybe had some kind of boat technology that allowed them to to colonize this uh, this continent, right? But there has been no, there is no trace of such boats. Uh, there is no remains, uh, and there is no real proof that it was the case. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so it's a very old uh, settlement, and um, which is much older than the rediscovery of this continent by Europeans. It was only in the 17th century. Right? So um, to study a bit the diversity, the diversity of this uh, continent, um, Eskivaloslav and his collaborators uh, got samples from um, 83 Australians that are scattered uh, over these different samples there. Uh, with the stars represent the sampling sites, and in parentheses you have the sample sizes. And uh, so they are scattered over different um, <coughs> regions, so northeast, uh, central desert, um, and uh, some coast uh, samples. And uh, also in this study we had available some 23, 25 um, Papuans from the highlands in, in uh, New Guinea. So um, I will not present you in details all the diversity of these samples, but just something that one needs to realize is that these samples, these Australian samples, were uh, some of them admixed. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we computed a bit admixture rates of the different samples, and uh, it varies between no admixture to up to 80% uh, admixture per individual. But these, these uh, volunteers were just self-reporting their ethnicity, so, um, <clears throat> so all of them consider themselves as Austrian Aborigines. Okay? So, uh, but of course, to infer properly the history of these individuals, we needed to look at individuals that were the least possible at mix, and that's why we concentrated our eyes, at least for this demographic inference, um, on some individuals from the Western Central Desert that, was, um, <clears throat> that had been in contact with Europeans very recently. Okay. So um, one of the questions that we were asked to address was to try to see if we can distinguish between different scenarios about the <coughs> colonization of Eurasia and Oceania by modern humans. And uh, until recently, the main model that was valid was a model where we had um, an expansion out of Africa, single exit out of Africa, and a single migration wave that led uh, some wave to go directly to Australia and, and New Guinea, and some other wave that went to Europe and Asia, and this Asian wave also led to the colonization of the Americans. But relatively recently, maybe in 2011, there was um, a study also led by S.K. Vyloslav that analyzed a single um, sample from Australia, uh, some tuff of hair that was at least 100 years old, so devoid of any admixture with uh, Europeans, in principle. And from the analysis, they inferred that it could have been actually two waves out of Africa. One that would have gone directly to Australia, and the second one that would have started maybe 15,000 years later that would have led to the colonization of Eurasia. Okay? So there were still these two competing hypotheses, and one <laughs> wanted to see with these new samples, which has much more information than before, uh, high uh, coverage, uh, what we could say about these scenarios. But to ex to study these scenarios well, we had also to take into account some other populations because now it is known that when people should, human populations migrated out of Africa, they hybridized with some archaic humans. Okay? So the current scenario is that there was maybe some uh, first hybridization with Neanderthals that occupied this range of Western Asia, and maybe later on for some population that led, that went to uh, Oceania, some later um, <coughs> admixture with some archaic are called Denisovans. Okay, so this Denisovan uh, population, we have no trace of them in East Asia, but we have just a trace of them in the Altai Mountains in this Denisova cave. That's why they're called Denisovans. So just to really, really summarize that very <coughs> grossly, somehow what has been found is that non-Africans have one, two, three, four percent maximum of Neanderthal-like mixture, so up to yes, four percent of their um, genome is from Neanderthal regions. 
But in Australians and in New Guineans, we have, in addition to that, 3 to 6% of the genome that is of Denisovan origin. Okay? So, which means that these Australians have something very special compared to non-Australians, and so we needed to take this uh, admixture into account because um, if you discount that, then uh, you wouldn't expect them to be as different as they are from the other humans. So we need to distinguish basically models um, where you would have a single wave out of Africa from models where we have two separate waves out of Africa. And to address this, we use this uh, list of full genomes. So uh, we compared our actually seven Australians from this Western Central Desert location to uh, some uh, Asians from China from, and to Europeans from Sardinia and to Africans in uh, Nigeria, Europeans. And we also added, uh, as I said, some neonatal genome and some Denisovan genome. So in total, uh, we got the full genomes of these individuals at more than 50x, and we really concentrated on non-genic regions to remove any potential effect of selection. Uh, we remove uh, CPG islands to re avoid uh, multiple hits by mutations, and we also excluded some regions that were difficult to align to nonotols and isolvents, uh, um, just to, to prevent some mismapping of uh, some reads. Okay? So in total, we had almost one gigabyte basis of data, uh, more than four million SNPs, and we used the six-dimensional Cyphrexy spectrum to fit our model. So what we get after many trials and tests of different models, uh, we get something like this. So we have a, uh, uh, on these graphs the relationship between the four modern humans populations, some West Africans, some Ryoba, Europeans, East Asians, and Australians. And uh, in this model, we allowed for two possible exits of... Um, uh, out of Africa, um, and uh, we also assume that we this exit occurred not directly from Europeans, but from maybe some East African population that diverged some time ago from this West African population. Okay, so uh, and if we examine a bit this scenario in more details, what we find is that the um, even though we could have had two exits out of East Africa, say. Uh, what we find is that the, the divergence time from this Afri East African population is super similar. Okay? And actually, we check that the likelihood if we just allow a single exit is identical to what we find in this case. So we have no evidence of two separate time of these exits out of Africa. So we also have relatively strong bottleneck that is associated to this exit that <coughs> there. Um, and also we find that um, we have a main source of admixture with nodotols that occurred uh, just after this bottleneck. So it's really as if there was some bottleneck to get out of Africa and then mixing immediately with nodotols. And then later on, we have some evidence of some additional uh, admixture pulse in Eurasians, but uh, almost nothing anymore in, in Australians. Okay? So if we really had to exit out of Africa, we would not see this shared um, admixture event, but we really, really expect to see two strong and independent admixture events in ancestors of Australians and the ancestors of Eurasians. Right? So this scenario really supports the view that um, there was actually a single exit out of Africa. Quite interestingly, if we, and, and this actually scenario was obtained by explicitly modeling admixture with archaics. Okay? So we also had this strong uh, input of Denisovan admixture uh, into Australians uh, only. And this is really in clear contrast to the results we find, the best thing we find, if we do not allow for admixture with archaics. Okay? When we don't allow explicitly to have admixture between uh, Nodotols and non-Africans and Denisovans and Australians, then what we find is some evidence of really two separate times of exit between uh, <clears throat> Australians on one side and Eurasians on the other side. Okay? 
Okay? Which really sub and that's really compatible with what was found before, but also in this previous study, this archaic mixture was not accounted for. Right? So it really seems that not taking into account this past history of admixture with archaic humans would give you the impression that the Australians are really super special compared to the other Eurasians, but actually they are not that. So to summarize this scenario, so we find evidence of initial exit out of Africa maybe 72,000 years ago, then some separation of these Australians from these other regions maybe 50,000 years, an arrival in Australia around 50,000 years, and for them, quite strangely, some <clears throat> date of admixture that is after this arrival in Australia, but uh, still the confidence interval is are overlapping. So we really don't know where this admixture occurred, but it must have occurred really very at a time that was very close to the settlement of Australia. Okay. And only later on, maybe 40,000 years ago, separation between uh, Europeans and Asians. And we also try to account for admixture with additional archaics, other than other social elements. We didn't find any evidence for this. And some groups have reported potential admixture with, of this Australian wave with some ancient humans that could have left Africa even earlier than this, but we didn't test this, so it's not impossible, but uh, <coughs> we don't know at this stage. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> and then the other example I wanted to present to you today is some study <coughs> that was led by uh, Thomas Marquez Bonnet from Barcelona, and to, uh, in which we have done a bit the same type of game, trying to find a bit the demographic history of um, <clears throat> some population, but this time not of humans, but of chimpanzees and bonobos. Okay? And this, again, this work was mainly driven by Vitor Souza and with the help of Isabelle Dupont. So um, if we look at the current distribution of these uh, chimpanzee and bonobo populations, we see that they occupy quite distinct um, regions. Okay? So <clears throat> the bonobos are just south of the Congo River, and all the chimpanzees are north of this Congo River. Also, other um, subspecies of, of chimpanzees are separated by some rivers, and it seems that these rivers may play a role in preventing gene flow, maybe not completely, but uh, at least to some extent. Okay? So currently, we have four recognized subspecies of chimpanzees, the Western chimpanzees, Niger Cameroon uh, group, the Central chimpanzee, and the Eastern chimpanzees. And they have their own <coughs> name, and they are quite different from the bonobos, which are different species. So this current distribution can be explained potentially by some past climatic changes, because we if we look at the current distribution of the rainforest, because these um, <coughs> chimpanzees and bobos live in the rainforest, currently we have uh, a large um, fragment of the rainforest on Central Africa, but also in some in Western Africa. Maybe 8,000 years ago, which corresponded to a much wetter phase of the climate, then this rainforest was completely uh, continuous between Western and Central Africa. But during the last glacial maximum, Actually, these forests were much smaller and uh, quite well separated. So, of course, these, the current distribution of chimpanzee does not correspond to events that necessarily occurred during those times, but it's likely that you had, during the Pleistocene, many cycles of dry and wet phases that could have led to the isolation of some species in some patches of forest. Right? So we think that maybe it's the climate that drove a bit these kind of speciation events. So if we just do a simple uh, principal component analysis, we see that the Western chimpanzee are very different from both the Central and Easterns, which are quite similar, and then that are quite far away from the Niger Cameroon <coughs> populations. Okay? And uh, that's only if we consider uh, chimpanzees, but then the question was to see if we find any trace of potential gene flow between these two species, chimpanzee on one side and uh, bonobos on the other side. And there were some hints of some potential gene flow by looking at very simple statistics like these D statistics. Okay, so these D statistics are obtained by comparing uh, an outgroup, in this case humans, 
to three populations. Okay? And when you consider um, sites, polymorphic sites where uh, bonobos have a derived allele, then you're asking yourself, is this derived allele more or less shared with two other populations, which could be central and, say, western chimpanzees? Okay? And if this derived allele is not more shared between bonobo and X and bonobo and Y population, then this D statistic should be zero. Okay? So if it's shared more with the X population, this D statistic should be larger than zero. If it's shared more than with the Y population, it should be smaller than zero. Okay? And when you compute this statistic between uh, <coughs> different X and Y chimpanzee populations, then you see that you have a positive values, which implies that you have um, had some gene flow um, between the bonobo and X because this additional gene flow makes you depart from um, the value of zero. Okay? And the largest discrepancies between central and western, which implies that central had much more <coughs> gene flow from bonobos than uh, western. So this statistic was really easy to compute, and there was really some uh, evidence that uh, there could have been some gene flow. But when, how much, that was still a bit of a, of a problem. Okay? So to answer these questions, we uh, looked at the genomic diversity of uh, 5 million per species. Uh, we had about uh, 1 gigabase again. And in that case, we had like 6 million SNPs to play with. Uh, we had to to um, add, add, add additional filters, actually, to this data set uh, because it was not really clear how we could define the ancestral state in the ancestors of bonobos and chimpanzees. So that's why we actually uh, <clears throat> looked at what we call the minor allele frequency spectrum, which is the, fra the, the, the fraction of the sites that have uh, uh, the, the least frequent alleles. Okay. And um, we also had to deal with another problem is that we potentially had many sites that went through multiple mutations. Because now here we are really looking at, we are comparing species, it's not like in humans, where we just compare populations. So the longer the genology, the more likely it is that a site had been hit many times by mutations. Okay? So for this, we used by uh, we, some statistic that is, um, are called uh, GURP statistics, which are just some conservation scores. And uh, these GURP scores, when a site has a, a score between minus two and two, it is uh, supposedly neutral and is not moving too fast. If it has a, <coughs> um, a statistic that is smaller than minus two, it implies that you had a lot of mutation at those sites. So we remove those potentially fast evolving sites from the analysis. And then we consider models where we had only four populations to simplify things. Okay. So, um, and then we compare different models uh, with and without um, bonobo gene flow. So, for instance, we use this model where we have a primary split between bonobos and common chimpanzees. And so that could have happened somewhere here. And we have this split, no gene flow. And then we have a lot of phase where we have divergence between this uh, more Western uh, chimps and central eastern ones, and we still have some kind of gene flow between the two. We allowed for gene flow between the two. Okay? And then this gene flow would stop at some time, and we also wanted to determine when this time was. Right? So this is a bit the kind of scenario that we envisioned, a bit a simplified version. And uh, when we have scenarios with bonobo gene flow, somehow we assume a bit similar things, but where we have actually um, gene flow between bonobos and either the ancestor of central and eastern and common chimps, and maybe more recently only with uh, central chimpanzees. Okay. And again, we allow for gene flow between chimpanzees. So when we compare these models with and without gene flow, what we find is something like this. We just compute the likelihood and look at the difference in likelihood, and we find that this difference is huge. Okay, so this is in uh, log 10 <coughs> likelihoods, and uh, even though we cannot formally test 
uh, that using likelihood ratios because we have composite likelihood and not proper likelihoods. We still think that this difference in log 10 likelihood is so huge that really this, we can clearly say that this model that includes migration with Bonobo is, is really favored um, by the data, right? So um, <clears throat> what we find finally, so it's a scenario where we would have a very old divergence between Bonobo and chimpanzees. Actually, models that do not include uh, migration between bonobos and chimpanzees would date this divergence maybe to less than one million years. And here we find uh, more than uh, 1.5 million years. Okay? So it's a much older divergence than, than what people would have thought previously. Uh, then uh, we also can date a bit the divergence time between these other uh, chimpanzee species. Um, maybe half a million year between a clay that would lead to Western and Niger Congo uh, from a clay that is uh, leading to Eastern and Central chimpanzees. And uh, maybe a quarter million year ago, diversion between Western and then Niger Congo. And very recently, less than 200,000 years, diversion between Eastern and Central. Okay. So uh, also we can try to measure this level of gene flow. What we find is that in the old part of the phylogeny, we have some kind of asymmetric gene flow with more gene flow from bonobo to chimps than from chimps to bonobos, but it's relatively comparable. Then uh, once the different subspecies of chimps uh, emerged, then we had some uh, gene flow in both directions, actually, some from ancestors of uh, these, these two lineages with bonobos, and but more recently we had mainly uh, gene flow from bonobos to central. Okay? And um, no real trace of direct gene flow or even indirect gene flow to western chimpanzees. So, um, and of course, we can also measure these um, <coughs> levels of gene flow between current populations, uh, actually. Okay? So, um, so I think that um, we can see that this next version sequencing data can allow you to really infer relatively complex scenarios. So most of these scenarios we've envisioned had more than 40 parameters. So it was uh, some very complex scenario that we can only uh, <coughs> investigate using these, uh, these whole genomes. Um, but this NGS data somehow needs still to some uh, Proper handling. So, for instance, uh, when you have uh, uh, non PCR free protocols, then you can have PCR duplicates and uh, somehow uh, include some PCR errors and, and excess of singletons in your site in the spectrum. So, that's a problem. So, uh, it's better to use these PCR free protocols. Um, what we also did was to really only consider sites that were devoid of any missing data. You have also to be careful about, it's not listed here, about the polarization of the ancestral state versus the arrived state, which is not always easy. Uh, you need really to have relatively high coverage data or find a way, and there are some tools for this, to try to infer the site frequency spectrum that with low coverage data. That's something also we learned that you need to remove these fast mutation rate sites especially for this case of interspecific comparisons. You cannot just handle intraspecific and interspecific uh, data in the same way. Um, also, we have been a bit wary of uh, some other filtering, like Hardy-Weinberg equivalent filtering, um, because when you do these Hardy-Weinberg filters on a pool of samples, somehow you would tend to exclude sites that have different frequencies in different populations. And uh, somehow you would only have sites where actually uh, that are compatible with high migration rate, if you want. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so um, you should really do hard equilibrium filtering just within population, not on whole uh, pooled samples. So um, these demarcate inference um, procedures are seem to be nice, but they require still a lot of computer time. So uh, last year we used more than half a million CPU hours to actually do this computation for these two, two studies. So it's really super computer intensive because uh, 
actually, I just show you the final results, but to read these final results, you need to test many different models, and you need to repeat experiments, you need to compute confidence intervals, and that requires really a lot of uh, computer time. So, um, <clears throat> and something uh, that I would also um, mention that is worth considering is that um, even though you can just take one single scenario and try to infer the parameters under this scenario, it's relatively easy, but what we have also learned is that you should really check that the scenario that you're envisioning is really the best possible scenario. And for that, you need to you know, examine different scenarios that includes on nut gene flow, that includes admixture on nut, and all these uh, different specificities, some population expansions, bottlenecks, to be really sure that in the end you've got the right one, even though we, we've never had the completely true history, but you should really take or put some efforts into exploring different models uh, in your data. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so this project was done with a lot of different people. So uh, Vito and Isabel uh, facilitated to development of the program and testing, the checking of different things. Um, and then you have all the people that were involved uh, in our Austrian project and in Chip and Zabonovo project. And of course, this is only a subset of uh, people that <coughs> contribute to studies. There are dozens and dozens of other people that are not listed here, but that you have seen the author list in the previous slides that are, needs to be acknowledged. And also, in the case of the Australian project, we also need to acknowledge all the participants to uh, <coughs> the sampling and the, the people who contributed their blood actually to make this study possible. And so I would be happy to answer any questions if you have any. And thank you for your attention.